So would you agree that we defensemen play that position because the other guys can't? Yeah, we're, they're not smart enough. Right. That's right. all it is. That's all it is. When we make a mistake or a wrong read, right. it's exposed a lot more than, right. than a forwards might be. And, um, you know, that's, that's where we have to do more thinking than they do. <laughs> I remember I went, we were playing at the Garden against the Flyers. And I like, you know, I like to carry the puck. I like, I like to have the puck. I like to, you know, I came out of the ore generation, right? Mm -hmm. So you're probably ending up, you know, you're the results of that right. change in the position. Sure. But I remember going wide on a guy named Ed Van Imp. And I remember I looked like I had him beat to the outside. And then I felt like, oh my God, what was that? Well, he two-handed me on my left shoulder, right? And so I go back to the bench. At that time, my partner was Nick Beverly. So I'm sitting on the bench, you know, bemoaning the fact that I think I just got shot. <laughs> and he says, kid, what did you learn? I, said, I don't know. He says, never go wide on Eddie Van Imp. <laughs> It was my first game, and I remember uh, we played the Canucks, the Vancouver Canucks, uh -huh. in my first game. And um, before the game, uh, my defensive coach, uh, Sly, Sylvain Lefebvre, you know, said, look, if the Sedins are out there, just try to change. You know, we're going to try to get that match up with, you know, a couple other guys. Like, all right, fine. So, lo and behold, I get caught out there, and <clears throat> I think it was Henrik gave the old and puck was wrapped around going behind the net and he's waiting there you know Isn't waiting right? for me to come and here I come in and he gives the between the legs pass to Daniel in front right. score you know <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself there it is you know like I've watched these guys dominate for so long and um, I was warned by the coaches <laughs> you know and everyone else in the world you know be careful when you're going in with, with the Sedins right? and yeah. Um, you know, that was, uh, that was a pretty humbling experience. Yeah, right. It's the moment you say, all right, well, I got to learn. I guess yeah. I'm in the big leagues now. And right? luckily, you know, I think everyone on the bench has at some point, point been, you know, a victim of that. that. Right? So <laughs> yeah. they, uh, they allowed me my moment. Great. I remember watching you and thinking, you know what, there, there's something special going on here. But I really didn't trust what I was seeing. So I called my brother Don, who was assistant general manager. He says, you got to come over and take a look at this kid. Tell me what you think. And I don't. I never thought he was very smart to begin with, but he did validate. My brother's not smart. We always <laughs> right? know that. He did kind of validate that thought. So, as a 14 or 15 year old, how does hockey look to you? I knew that I was good for my age, but once you get to high school, it's a different game. I mean, you're playing against. I was playing with your son, mm -hmm. who was, you know, this gigantic human <laughs> being, and I'm thinking to myself, how am I going to compete against this guy right. on the ice? Right. Um, but you find your way, and I think that was, uh, you know, the the best part of that experience my freshman year at Brunswick was um, learning how to play against older players, stronger players. You have to figure out how to play the game a different way. Um, and luckily I had you know you to help me out and, and um, teach me the fundamentals of what you need going forward, but also allow me to keep you know what's good in my game and, and make sure that that uh, you know, isn't lost in the in the shuffle at the same time. So how important was it to learn to compete and be as good as you can be at that age? Or do you remember it being that way? You know, it was it was funny. At the at Brunswick at the time, you know, there was a drop off from yeah, your first right. line players right. to your fourth line players and um, you know, now they've turned themselves into a, sure. a factory it seems like. But um, you know, I think from for me it was a it was a matter of pushing myself to compete against those first and second line guys. Uh, and and not settle for, you know, doing well against, you know, maybe the guys who were just starting to pick up hockey or right. whatever it might have been. Um, so, you know, so I think that was, uh, you know, having you, having John Riley, right. the guy who, you know, before that, yeah, before right. I got to Brunswick, had always pushed me right. out of my comfort zone. Um, having, you know, two um, well-respected coaches in my, you know, in my mind, mm -hmm. um, telling me that, you know, not that it wasn't good enough, but you have more. You, you can be better. Uh, you know, that can be tough at times, but at the same time, once you get through to the other side and you see the kind of the light at the end of the tunnel, um, it does huge things for your game. For me, it was probably a year, two years, where I really felt, you know what? 
I think I, I think I can make a go of this. You know, I was just kind of the guy they traded for. I felt like I really had to prove myself at that camp and make the team. So the World Hockey Association in the early 70s became a, comp a competing market, right? Mm -hmm. So I had met with um, Vancouver, the World Hockey had approached us, um, wondering if we wanted to sign. And at the time, my attorney was Alan Eagleson, who would be more remembered in infamous ways. But at the time, he was an important guy to a lot of us. Mm -hmm. um, I'll never forget, um, he said, I can, we can pick up the phone and uh, I can get you probably $300,000. So my father was an old Irish farmer and, and uh, hmm. construction guy. And he used to roll his own cigarettes, right? So he's starting to roll the cigarette, and now he hears the number, and the shards of tobacco are flying out. <laughs> so that's probably 15 years of earnings in his, <laughs> right. his life, right? right? And Eagleson says, but I'm not going to call them. <clears throat> the cigarette rolling stops, right? Because Eagleson obviously was in, in, in uh, you know, knew what was going to happen. There's going to be an underage draft. So, so fast forward to May, I, I was still in high school. And I left high school at noon. There was a meeting of all of Eagleson's clients. And I actually heard that I was drafted by the Rangers um, on the radio. There's so many lines of communication right. now. Um, mm -hmm. And you, the process now, you know, you're going to the combine. Um, you're, you know, doing your physical testing in front of all these teams. You're also interviewing with all these teams. And what, you know, seems like you're in a, a prison, um, you know, you're this, Thinking back on it now, it's it's, it's amazing. Like you're right. 17 years old, you're sitting right. in a hotel room, and you have eight, nine, you know, adults from whichever team grilling you, um, and really just waiting to see if you're going to crack. Right. And uh, you know, it was it was a very um, daunting experience, very exciting. You know, you don't know, sure. really know how to how to play with it, but. Um, once draft day came, you kind of knew it's all over and it's out of your hands. Uh, and over the course of the day, you're talking to your agent. You know, he's next to my side. Right. Jordan was was uh, mm -hmm. was near me and you know telling me, I just talked to Boston. They're picking at number eight. Um, all their scouts said that if you're around, um, they're taking you. Wow. So you have that in your mind. And then it's Florida call. They're picking at ten. Um, they are uh, going to take you if you're there. So now you're starting to play with all these different scenarios. You're telling yourself you're going to be eighth overall, but things change on the sure. night of. And I remember, and, and this is not to uh, discredit Tommy, Thomas Hickey right. um, from the Islanders, but um, he was picked by the LA, LA Kings, Kings right. in the top ten, and it was kind of an off-the-board pick that right. no one really expected. And it just completely changed the shuffle from, from that moment right. on. So there were a lot of us sitting in the stands, you know, for the next five or six picks after him, like, what's going on? Right. Um, and I remember the Blues were very interested, and they had traded up to, uh, to a number 11, I think. And I thought, all right, this is it. And they picked Lars Eller. Right. And then I'm kind of sitting there like, I guess I'm going to drop now. And then all of a sudden, Colorado picks me at 14. And, right. Um, you know, and, and in hindsight, nothing really matters until that moment, you know, until right. your name's announced. And, um, it happened so quickly, and you're sitting in the stands, the next thing you know, you're being whisked away, and there's a jersey on, you're standing on stage. But, um, you know, I, I think when I always look back on it, I, I had my parents there, I had my yeah. brothers there, my grandmother, and uh, that's what was really, you know, the most important moment to me. So, you know, I was drafted as a 17-year-old, turned 18 uh, that July. Um, my first training camp was actually in my hometown of Kitchener. <laughs> and uh, ended up in Providence. And finally, midway through my second season as a pro, I get the call and my career starts. But I, you know what, Kevin, I remember thinking that, you know, I, when it first started, I was just hanging on. <laughs> just hanging on not to make a mistake, um, not to give them a reason to catch, keep, take you out of the lineup. And for me, it was probably a year two years where I really felt, you know what, I think I, I think I can make a goal of this. Right. I didn't make the team out of training camp, right. um, 
my I, I left after three years of school, so I was you know 21 at the time, yeah, so right. a little farther, a little older. Um, and I, you know, I think a fault of my own. I just assumed that I was the 14th overall pick, and I would get the first shot, and then maybe I'd be sent down. Um, so that was kind of a, a humbling experience. Mm -hmm. um, I was scratched in the minors by mm -hmm. Coach Quinn, Quinn right. um, and then I got called up a few games later, and, and had just started to work and get my game back. And Kyle Comiskey uh, had a concussion, so that's what I was called up for. They told me it'll be two weeks, uh, and then he'll probably be back. And you know, and that helped me. You know, I, I said I have two weeks to play my best hockey. I'm probably going to get sent back down, mm -hmm. but let me just give everything I have and um, and show them that when it's time, you know, I'm the guy that they want to call up. And his concussion turned into two months. You know, he just couldn't recover from right. it, and um, I started to play really well at that level. And and I think, like you said, at the first the first year, I felt like I was fighting to stay up, and, and I had a hunger. Um, I was traded, which completely blindsided me, and, and that made me realize that you're never safe, um, sure. no matter who you are. And I think the going into training camp with the Blues the next year, with a team that really had not invested anything into me in my development, you know, I was just kind of the guy they traded for. I felt like I really had to prove myself at that camp and make the team. Um, and then once I made that team, I felt like, you know, I, I was on the right. power play, things started to click, and that's when it, it started to, to hit home. I always tried to have in my game mm -hmm. was, was just, you know, the poise with the puck to allow things to develop um, and, and see, you know, all aspects of the ice. To me, the greatest player that ever played was Bobby Orr. And I had, uh, I went to his camp as a 12-year-old. Um, I got a job as a junior counselor at his camp as a 13-year-old. Um, so to this day, he's the person that for me right. walks on water. And he just, he opened the game up from a defensive standpoint mm -hmm. for, for all of us. And then, you know, in my generation, I got to play against Bobby uh, for a year and a half, two years. And then there was Pot, Dennis Podvin. Uh, Ray Bork, Mark Howe, Paul Coffey, mm -hmm. all great players. And I think all of them, for me anyway, I was a, certainly attracted to them because I wanted to play like them. Right. I thought it was more fun to have the puck and yeah. make a play right. than have to go chase it. You know, to your point, Bobby Orr was, you know, it, it was like in my generation, we all knew that Bobby Orr was the reason why defensemen play the way they do right. now. Um, you know, obviously, uh, the guy I always talk about is Brian Leach. Mm -hmm. um, you know, his, for me, it was his poise, and I think that was uh, something that I always tried to have in my game mm -hmm. was, was just, you know, the poise with the puck to allow things to develop um, and, and see, you know, all aspects of the ice. And, um, you know, after he retired, uh, and, you know, he, during the course of his career as well, Nick Lidstrom. Oh, wow. um, Mm -hmm. You know, was he was someone who did things that I said to myself, I'll never be able to do that. Right. You know, and, and I think uh, when I finally played against him and saw it in real life, I still said to myself, I can't do that. You right. know, it's, it's just a different level. Right. Um, you know, his, his ability to walk along the blue line, drag a puck with his head up. Right. And, you know, he could lift his stick up for a slap shot and the puck's still moving at perfect speed right. until that moment where he hits it and right. it's, you know, picks his corners from the blue line. Right. Um, you know, these were like, those were the moments and, and the, like you said, the, the qualities and, and the skills that I worked on because, you know, my idols were doing it. When you talk about veteran presence, for me, Carol Vadney, God rest his soul, hmm. um, was my mentor. You know, he was a, a, you know, a classy Frenchman. He smoked cigars. He drove a big Cadillac in those days. <laughs> he dressed to the nines. He was awesome. It, it, does that still work, or was there somebody that had an influence on you? Yeah, I, I had a, a couple. I mean, Adam Foote was in, right. Car in Colorado when I got there, and, right. and um, I wish, you know, I had more time with him because I really loved him as a teammate and, you know, soaked everything in. Um, 
but he was someone who, you know, was just like a god to me, you know, just growing up watching him play and, and watching, you know, that avalanche dynasty. Um, but really the, the guy that, that was, you know, the, the true epitome of a professional player was Barrett Jackman. Mm -hmm. And in St. Louis. Uh, when I got to St. Louis, he mm -hmm. became my D partner. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he took it upon himself to put me under his wing and, and show me um, the ins and outs of how to play at the professional level. But really, it was away from the rink. Um, you know, the way he, that he was a family man, um, his community presence, the way he carried himself, uh, that was, you know, what I really admired about him most. And, um, you know, Today, even when I see him, he was at my wedding. He still calls me kid, you know. So it's uh, I'll never lose that. Yeah, and, right. and that's you know that's how I feel like he's my older brother who, um, you know, just just wants the best for not only me but all of his teammates. When I got traded to Buffalo and got to see Ray Bork, we played him like six times right. in like six weeks, and you go, holy cow, right. that guy is a player. Right. Do you look at guys in the league? Sure. Sure, I think the one thing that I always try to do is I try to learn, oh, you know, from, from players in the league. And, um, you know, I know I'll never have Dustin Bufflin slap shot, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I think the way that he positions himself right. to, for his one-timers, you know, the way right. he finds the space. Um, Eric Carlson, the way that he wrists pucks in from the blue line, um, the way he walks the blue line. Um, you know, there's so, many, there's so many skilled players now, skilled defensemen. Right. Um, and I think we, I hope that we all kind of take something from each other. Sure. Uh, I had to play against Duncan Keith for a long time uh, in St. Louis. Right. And he was someone who, you know, was like a thorn in our sides, always. He always had that, that moment where um, he would stick, you know, the final knife into us. And, you know, I, I strived for that, you know, and, and my coaches, you know, they, they impressed that upon me. They said, right. this is someone you can be. Ken Hitchcock said, we, I want you to, play reckless like Duncan Keith. Um, you know, calculated risk, but, mm -hmm, sure. uh, you know, I think there's so many guys that I've learned from um, that are still in the league, and, uh, you know, I enjoy watching the highlights and seeing these guys perform, as long as it's not against us. I remember skating off, getting off the ice, walking through the tunnel into the locker room, and there was a fan, a Rangers fan, and he said, Shattenkirk, if you want to make it in this city, you better play better than that. <laughs> My most vivid memories of playing at the Garden, and, and I think it happens to all of us, is when you're good. Right. Like when your teams are good. Mm -hmm. So we beat the Islanders and lose to Montreal in the finals in 79. And that was so electric. Hmm. I remember game three, Billy Joel sang the national anthem, right? And I used to, I was on the starting lineup, mm -hmm. and I used to try and hit, leave the line just about the end of the anthem. So I'd make my lap around, and I remember I made my lap around just as Billy Joel was leaving the ice, and I gave him a whack. And I remember him looking, looking around like, what was that? And the crowd, they, you know, the crowd was on top of the ice in those days. Right. In those days, you could smoke, right? <laughs> so the second period, there was like this haze, and it was almost like a boxing match. <laughs> and so there's this certain sense and I think we create that sense because it's the great, greatest city in the world. Right. So make no mistake for me, the greatest moments were moments of success. Right. When I was, you know, on St. Louis in Washington, um, everyone circles their game against the Rangers at Madison Square Garden. Right. Uh, you feel like once you've played that game and skated on that ice, that's when you've made it. Um, and for my first three years pro, I never played at MSG. Right. Uh, it just didn't work out with the scheduling. But, you know, fast forward to last year and stepping on for the first time uh, as a Ranger, you know, that buzz um, and that sort of electricity was something that I knew the city had, but yeah. I until I you're out there and you right. experience it, and it's right. you know all in your favor. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's a different experience, and and I think for me it's it's just a little bit more special knowing that I have so much support in the stands, yeah, right. um, whether it's family or not. There are friends, there are you know um, coaches who who sure. you know were a 
pretty big part of, of my career. Right. Um, and they shoot me a text after a game and say, good game, even if it was my worst. You know? <laughs> and and uh, you know, I think that's, uh, that's something for me that is very hard to, to create, recreate. Right. Um, and you know, I want, I know what the city is like when the teams are winning. Right, right. I remember being here a few summers ago for, you know, my season ended and the Rangers are in the Stanley Cup Finals and, you know, going into the city for dinner, you felt the buzz yeah, around the sure. team and you know what that's like uh, as an outsider. And that's something that, you know, I'm striving for now as, as a player on this team to, to bring that back. I remember when Phil Esposito got traded from the Bruins mm -hmm. and they were in Oakland, right? And he got called in by Harry Sinden in a hotel room. And Phil said, if you're trading me, don't trade me to New York because I'm not going to go. <laughs> <laughs> right, because <laughs> we're talking about mid seventies now. Right, uh, right you know exactly. uh, the city's a lot different then. But I do get right, I, but, and they were rivals, right? right? right. But it is real yeah. in this day and age when guys they look at the schedule and say we're going to Manhattan and we're playing the Rangers. Yeah, I mean, without a doubt, it's uh, That's awesome. It's it's the place that everyone circles, um, you know, and I think it may not be as iconic to everyone in the league, but you know, you skate out and you see that ceiling. Whether you've known it or you haven't, right. uh, I think guys say like, "Wow! I mean, this right. place is, you know, this place is it." Yeah. You know? So uh, that's and that's how I felt. I remember there's a guy. He used to sit. You know, this is 35 years ago, so he evidently haven't gotten over it. Um, but he used to sit and bust my chops every single night, right? As a 21 and 22 year old, you're like, yeah, I've never heard that before, right? But you fast forward and you kind of think about it and you think, you know what? That guy cares. Growing up and knowing what New York fans are like, uh, <laughs> thank God I had that experience. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and, and being in St. Louis, uh, we had amazing fans there. Yeah. Um, but Midwesterners by nature are just down to earth, like very genuine and right. nice people. Uh, they won't. <laughs> They won't push too many buttons. And coming to New York, uh, you get a little different taste. <laughs> and, you know, I, I think my most uh, vivid memory is our first game of the, the year last season. Um, we played against Colorado. We lost, mm -hmm. I think, three to one. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I, I was minus two during the game and, and had a, an assist. And I remember skating off, getting off the ice, walking through the tunnel into the locker room. And there was a fan, a Rangers fan, and he said, Shattenkirk, if you want to make it in this city, you better play better than that. <laughs> and it's a running joke in the locker room now. Mark Stahl always, you know, like, <laughs> will repeat it to me. But, right. um, you know, I was like, there it is. There's my first taste of, right. of, um, of the fans. And, and it didn't hurt me um, because I know that, if I go out the next game and I have well, that's exactly a phenomenal true. game, right. Right. that's the same guy who's going to be patting me on the back. Um, and like you said, they just they wear their emotions on their sleeves. Um, they they ride that roller coaster just like we do as players. Um, and you know you really appreciate that when when you get a taste for it. <laughs> <laughs>